All right, so let's get going on the second problem set here for the ISA work. So we're going to start off again with a review. So again, your instructions are to write down your own answers to the questions after you both answer them yourself, then discuss the answers in your group. So let's go ahead and get started. Here are questions. So go ahead and pause the video, answer the questions first on your own, and then discuss them with your partner. All right, so let's see what answers I had here. And you may have different answers, but these are the parts that I thought were the most important for this. So why do we have register conventions? And it's for interoperability with other code. It's so that we can call functions and procedures and have them work together, even if they're coming from code that we didn't write. When we have these register conventions, it means you don't need to know what registers other parts of the program are using or how they're using them. You can trust that when you do a call, you know what's going on and what your responsibility is. This means that we avoid writing over registers that other parts are using. So the second question, can we use reg any register for anything? <clears throat> and this is somewhat of a trick question. So I'm going to give you two answers, yes and no. So for yes, except for R0, they're all the same. So we can't write anything to R0, but all the other registers, we can write anything we want to them, we can store them and use them however we want. However, if we overwrite registers, other parts are depending on will crash. So we can't use any register for anything if we have this other part in here where we, other code depends on us. There are some other tricky parts about RA. So if we're going to return from a function call and we do jump and link, it puts the data in a particular place. So if we overwrite that without thinking about it, our program may not work. But we could use that register for anything else we wanted to. Remember, RA is just register 31. So there's nothing special about the underlying register. All right, do procedures have to put data on the stack in a particular order? And again, there are two ways you can look at this. <clears throat> so no, each procedure can store whatever it wants on the stack. The order doesn't matter <clears throat> as long as the procedure is consistent. So it can store register S1 and then S2 or S2 and then S1. It can do it however it wants. But we have to leave the stack the way it was when we were done. So we can put whatever we want on the stack in any order we want, but when we're done with our call, when we exit the procedure we end, we better put it back just the way it was. And we better not touch anything else on the stack or we'll mess up the other procedures themselves. So do we have to put it in a particular order? Inside each procedure, no, but outside we have to make sure that we don't mess up anything. Okay, so here's an instruction. It's a pure instruction question. So pause the video, answer the question first on your own. Once you've each got your own answers, then go ahead and discuss it. Okay. So how would the following new instruction affect the performance of loading a 32-bit constant? So remember, to load a 32-bit constant before, we were going to use one of these instructions to load part of the immediate and then the other part. So the new instruction we have here is luli, load, on, load upper large immediate, and it's going to large, load the largest immediate we can into register 1. So <clears throat> which format do we want to use here? Well, we're going to use the J format, because we don't need to specify a register. And the J format doesn't specify. So if we use the J format, we get 26 bits of immediate that we can load. And that's better than a regular I format, which only gives us 16 bits. So let's take a look at what we do with the th standard load. So the standard load, we're going to do load upper immediate to get the first half of it in here. So this is going to load into register 1, the first half of our constant. Then we're going to OR it with an immediate with the second half. And so that's going to provide the second half. So here we had two instructions that loaded the two halves, the two 16 bits of the immediate. Now we've got this new instruction that we're developing, and it's going to try and load more. So we're going to load the first part, and we get 26 bits. Now that's not 32, so we still need to fill in the rest. Now we're going to have to go and find those last six bits, and we're going to have to use ORI again. So now we've got 26 bits, and we get the rest six bits, so we've loaded it. And note, we still had two instructions here. So in the standard way, we had two instructions, and now with the new one, we have two instructions. So it's no faster. This is going to be the same speed, because even though we can load more in the first instruction, we still need a second instruction to load the remaining bit. All right, so here's a practice for encoding branches and immediates. And what this problem is about, we want to design a new format, a K format instruction, so that we can do branch equals immediate. So remember, our branch equals just compares two registers. We want a branch equal immediate, which allows us to compare a register file and an immediate to do that. All right, so go ahead, pause the video, answer the question together with your partner, and when you've got an answer, go ahead and continue the video. Okay, let's go through this problem here. 
So what information we need to be encoded in the instruction? So for the first part here, this new instruction, which allows us to have an immediate in here, what does it need to encode? Well, it needs to code the opcode. Well, all instructions need to code the opcode, so we know what instruction they are. It needs to encode one register, so we know where to, what to compare to, and then two constants or two immediates. So in this example here, we need to encode the seven and the loop. So why can't we have this with our current formats? Well, none of them have two constants, so we can't fit it in there. Also, if we wanted two 16-bit constants, we'd have somewhat of a problem. So our entire instruction is 32 bits long. So if we needed two 16-bit constants, we need 32 bits. So there wouldn't be any room for the opcode or the register. So now comes the fun part of this. We're gonna to have to make some trade-offs. So what trade-off can we make? Well, smaller constants. So we don't have all that much space for the constant. In fact, if we need one of these registers and one opcode, we have the remaining space over here available. So here's our opcode and here's our register. We now have this much space available. We have 21 bits available to do stuff. And so we have to divide that between the immediate for comparing the branch value and the address we're going to branch to. So we can trade off how much we want, how big we want each of those to be, depending on how big an immediate we want to be able to compare and how big a branch we want. So in this case, with this branch, our address is only 11 bits, whereas with the I format, it was 16 bits. So we can't branch as far, but we can have this immediate built in. And so we can do the comparison. Okay, here's another peer instruction problem. So pause the video, answer the question on your own first. Once you have your own answers, then discuss them with your partner. Okay, so we're looking at which of these instructions will jump forward four instructions. So we've got a bunch of branch equals. Now the last one here is can't tell. Conditional branches depend on the values. And this is true, but look what we're comparing here. We're comparing R1 and R1. So R1 will always be equal to itself. So these will always branch. So this one isn't the answer. Now the question is how far are we going here? So these ones here are 16 and 12, so that's bytes. And these are four and three, so that's instructions. So when you do a branch equal is the offset in bytes or instructions. Well, it's in instructions. Remember we talked about how the constant gets shifted left by two, same as multiplied by four before adding to the PC. So this one here would go 16 instructions off or 12 instructions off. So that's not what we want. So now it's one or the other of these. Now, the question is which will jump forward four instructions? And so you'd think the answer was four here, but we have to remember that we always do PC plus four. So PC plus four automatically jumps forward one instruction. We wanna jump forward four instructions, so we need to only jump forward three, and then we'll end up four instructions ahead. So remember this PC plus four is always happening, even if we're doing an offset from the branch. All right, let's take a look at this in a little more detail. So here's branch not equal in this case, and we're gonna compare two things and we're gonna put in a destination. So our destination is three. So we're saying an offset of three here. How does this work out? Well, we go ahead and we encode it into this I format instruction. Here we've got our two registers we're comparing, and now we're gonna put in three here in binary, which is all zeros and one one. Now, we're gonna go ahead and add this in. So we're gonna take our current 32-bit PC, we're gonna add in four, so that's PC plus four, and then we're gonna add in the branch offset. But to calculate the branch offset, we're gonna take our 16-bit immediate from here, we're gonna shift it over by two bits, this multiplied by four, so we're converting from bytes to instructions, because each instruction is four bytes, so we shift it over by two, shift it over two, which is multiplying by four, and we're gonna sign extend. So we take this value here, shift it over by two, so now it becomes one, one, zero, zero, and we're gonna sign extend it. Now this is a zero in the sign bit, it's a positive number, so the sign extension is zero. Now we go ahead and we add these together. So we take our current PC plus four, plus the offset there, shift it over by two, and that gives us our next PC. So this is the equivalent of the three times four, multiplying it by four bytes. Okay, here's another practice problem. So go look at the code and identify the destination for the jump, and then fill in the constant needed to jump to that point. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and answer your question together with your partner. All right, let's take a look at this one. So where do we wanna jump back to? Well, we wanna jump back up to this add i because we're gonna go around the loop and we're gonna increment i until it equals 10, so we wanna go back to the i. These two up here, they're just setting up the variables before the loop, so we don't wanna jump up to that. Okay, so branch not equals relative. We don't need to know the PCs of this. We need to know how much further back we wanna go. And here are the offsets and bytes. So if this is the current instruction, this one is four bytes before it. One instruction is one byte. This one is eight bytes before it. Two instructions is eight bytes. 
So we put in a minus three here. Okay, so what's the connection between minus three and minus eight here? Well, minus three instructions is gonna be minus 12 bytes. Because remember, we shift this over and multiply it by four. So this is gonna go back minus 12 bytes. Now, that seems like it will end us up in the wrong place. But remember, we got that PC plus four. So the PC plus four is gonna bring us one further than that. So we're gonna go back three instructions, or 12 bytes, plus four bytes, which means we go back only eight bytes, so we're gonna end up at the correct place here. Okay, here's another peer instruction problem. And I've got some hints here for figuring out all the callie save and uh, caller save instructions. And you can use this later in the problem set as well. So pause the video and answer the question first on your own and then discuss it with your partner. Okay, so saving and restoring and procedures. The question here is which registers does this function need to save and restore and why? So let's take a look at these. So A0 is an argument to the function. It's coming into the function here. And we use A0 is an argument to the subfunction here. And V0 is the result from the subfunction used to call the results. So we don't need to do anything with those. Now let's look at our other register here. So these are T0, these are temporaries. Now temporaries are caller saved. That means the caller, that is this function, needs to save them if it needs to use them again. So do we need to save these? Do we use them again? Well, they're caller safe, but we don't use them. So you see what happens here. We're using these at this point, but then we call sub function and sub function could write over them or do whatever it wants to them, but we don't care because we never use them again. So even these are, though these are caller saved, because we don't use them after we do the call, we don't care about saving them. So we do not need to save those. So we don't need to save those two. Okay, let's take a look at S1 here. So do we need to save S1? S1 is callee save. So that means that when, even though we are using S1 again here, if sub function overwrites it, it's sub function's responsibility to save it. So we don't need to save S1 for sub function. However, what if whoever called us is using S1? Well, whoever called us, if they're using S1, they're counting on us to fix S1, to save it. So we don't need to save it for ourselves, but we need to save it for whoever called us. So we do need to save S1 as a callee. So if somebody called us, we used S1, we need to save it. But if sub function messes it up, it will protect it for us. Okay, how about RA? So RA is callee saved. So if sub function changes it, it will preserve it. But we need to preserve it for whoever calls us. So when we call jump and link sub function here, we're actually overwriting RA. So we're putting a new value into RA when we jump to sub function. So we'd better save it, otherwise we won't return to the right place. So we need to save RA as a callee because we're overwriting it. All right, now we're gonna have a practice on procedure calls here. So let's take a look at the program we have here. This is a program, it's the main part of the program starts off, it goes through and it calls manipulate. Manipulate does some work and then it calls double. Double does some work, it returns back, manipulate finishes and it comes back into main and main exits, okay? So we're gonna go through, we're gonna fix up this problem so that it follows this code, so it follows the function call uh, procedures. So there are a few problems here. Neither one of the, none of these things are following the register convention for arguments and results. It's the first thing we gotta fix. They're not saving the necessary temporaries on the stack and the program will never exit. And so think about this, think about what JR does and what value it's gonna have. So we're gonna go through this. We're gonna first identify callers and callees, then fix the rest of the program problems. Okay, so start off identifying callers and callees, pause the video, answer the questions together with your partner. Okay, so let's go through this. So first, is main a caller or a callee? Well, main is only a caller. No one calls main, that's where your program starts. So you notice it just begins and then exits. So there isn't something around main here. So main is only a caller. How about manipulate? Well, manipulate is called by main, so it's a callee, and it calls double, so it's a caller. So it does both, it's both a callee and a caller. And how about double? Double never calls anything, so it's only a callee. Okay, now go through this and we need to fix up the code now. So the first thing you need to do is make sure we follow the procedure, sorry, follow the register conventions for arguments and results. Take a look at that sheet you have with all the instructions, with all the registers so you know where they go and then save the necessary temporaries on the stack. So go ahead, pause the video, 
Answer the question together with your partner. There's no right answer to this. There are a whole bunch of ways to solve this. There are definitely wrong answers to this. And after you've come up with an answer together, go ahead and continue the video. All right, so let's go ahead and clean up this. So first we need to fix up the arguments and results. So what are the arguments and results for manipulate? Well, it's specified here. Manipulate's gonna take in this A and B and it's gonna return it in S0. And A and B are stored up here in T4 and T5. So the arguments currently are in T4 and T5 and the results coming back in S0, but that's not where they should be. Remember, according to the calling convention, the argument should be in A0 and A1 and the results in V0. So we need to change the code so that it works that way. So what I did here was I put in a copy. I said, well, our code up here is using T4 and T5, so I'm gonna copy T4 into A0 and T5 into A1. I'm just using an add with zero. So now, A, now T4 and T5, our arguments are in A0 and A1, so that's correct. And then we need to make sure that the results come back, we use them in the right place. So we need to replace this with V0. So now manipulate is expected to return in V0 and we use V0 down here. Okay, so here's how I've updated my code. Now what temporaries are used by me? Well, main uses the temporaries T4 and T5, and these are caller saved. So the question is, do we need to save T4 and T5? Well, so T4 and T5 might be overwritten by manipulate, but we only need to save them if we're gonna use them again. So if you look at it here, T4, we are gonna use it again. So after manipulate, we use T4. So if manipulate overwrites T4, we need to make sure we save it, since it's caller saved, so that we have it available. But T5, we never use it again. So if manipulate overwrites T5, that's fine. So what we need to do is we need to save T4 in the stack and we need to restore T4 from the stack before we continue. Okay, so I did this copying here for A0 and A1. Could we have just used A0 and A1 at the start instead? And the answer is yes, we could have done that. We would have still had to save one, we still needed a copy. Because if you look at this over here, this T4, sorry, T4, even if I put T4 in A0, I still need T4 at the end here. So I still would have had to save it to the stack to protect it from manipulate. So yeah, you could do this differently. You could have put these in a different place and then you would have had to save a different register, but it would have been somewhat more efficient than doing it this way. So as I said, there are lots of different ways to do this. Okay, let's go on and take a look at the next function, manipulate here. So go ahead and pause the video, answer this together with your partner. Okay, let's go through the register conventions. And now we're gonna to have to do these twice. So first for what manipulate itself expects as the register and for what double is using. Okay, so what are the arguments and results for manipulate? Well, the arguments are coming in in T0 and T1. So it says, well, this is set up. It thinks it's getting in T0 and T1 and it's putting back its result in R5. That's right, in T5. And that's not what we want. They should be in A0, A1 and V0 for the results following the convention. So we need to change the code over here. So we expect our inputs in A0 and A1 and we deliver our results in V0. Okay, so that fixes up manipulate. What about double? So what are the arguments and results for double? Well, the arguments for double are coming from, are going in in T3 and T4, or sorry, T2 and T3, C and D here. And it's taking, we're getting the results back in T4 and T5. And again, this doesn't follow the conventions. They should be in A0 and A1 and V0 and V1. So we need to go ahead and fix this up. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna take the values that I wanted and I'm gonna copy them into A0 and A1 so that they're in the right place for double. And then the results from double need to come back in V0 and V1. And so I'm going to use these here in my code correctly. And remember, we're gonna to have to go into double and we're gonna to have to fix that up so it does the right thing as well. Okay, so now we cleaned up the code in terms of the inputs and outputs for all of our calling conventions. Now we need to figure out what do we need to save. So what temporaries are used by manipulate? Well, manipulate uses T2, T3, T4, and RA. So RA is a temporary. It's a call save. So RA needs to be saved if, we're going to, if we need it again. So let's take a look at what we've got here. So do we need to save these? So T2 and RA. T2 down here we're using again after we make the call, and RA we're using after we make the call. So when we do jump and link to double, that's actually gonna replace RA, but we need the old value of RA here to get back. So we're gonna to have to store RA after that. And T2 here, if double overwrites T2, then we are going to need to save it because we need it back. And since we don't know if double overwrites R2, or sorry, T2, we have to save it anyways. But the other ones here, we don't have to save. 
So T3 and T4, do we need to save those? Well, no, we don't reuse them afterwards. So let's go ahead and now we'll fix this up. So we'll move our stack pointer down by eight to make space for saving two things. We'll save T2 and RA, then we'll recover T, we'll pop load T2 and TA off the stack again and put our stack pointer back. Now, look at T4 here. We are doing something with T4 here. And so the question is, do we need to save T4? And the answer is no, we don't need to save T4 because we're writing it. So even if double puts something else in T4, here we're putting something new in T4, so we don't need to save it. Okay, now for the last one. Let's take a look at double and figure out what you need to fix up here. So go ahead with your partner, answer the question, and pause the video. Okay, so let's start off. Well, double is fine. If you look at it, it's got its arguments coming in in A0 and A1, and it's putting its results in V0 and V1, and it uses no temporaries. So we're all set for double. Excellent. So let's go and summarize what it is we did here. We first went through and identified the callers and colleagues. So we knew who was calling what, and what was also both a caller and a colleague. We then made sure the arguments and results were in the right registers. So you make sure that your input and output of each function is the right place. Then we looked at the callee saved registers. If the callee writes to them, then we need to save them. So if something is supposed to be saved by us and we change it, then we need to save it. Then we look at the caller saved registers. These are things that we need after a call. So if we use something and we need it after a call, we can't trust that it will still be there. So we have to save it if it's caller saved. All right, so here are two extra questions. They're optional. If you'd like to do them, go ahead, pause the video and answer them with your partner and discuss them. Okay, so for the first one here, if we added a new instruction that only specified one register, how large a constant could it hold? Well, we saw this earlier. So if we take the I format, which is 16 bits of constant, and then we remove one of the registers from it, we get an extra five bits for a total of 21 bits that we can hold. Here's an example where main is using a bunch of registers, B is using a bunch of registers, C is using a bunch of registers, and they're calling each other. And so the way to solve this is to go look at main and figure out what are the things that main needs to solve. So main needs to solve the caller saved ones because it's a caller. B needs to save both the caller saved and callee saved ones because it's a caller and a callee. And C just needs to save the callee saved ones because it's just a callee. This is assuming, of course, that you're using these after the call in the middle here. All right, now it's time for the reflection at the end of this. So individually go through and do the following. What was most interesting you learned in this module? What was most boring? And then what is something you feel you don't quite understand? So pause the video and answer these questions on your own. Okay, now for the second part, swap your answers with your partner and fill in the following. What did your partner find confusing? Try to identify a different way to think about that to help your partner with it. So it doesn't have to be deep or long. It could be, you know, look at more examples or something like that, but something could help your partner. And then write down what did your partner provide to help you with your confusion. So go ahead and pause the video and answer these together with your partner. And that's it. Thank you.